Good evening, everyone. I always feel <clears throat> it's a minor miracle that we have this time to gather and to, I mean, for <clears throat> a group of human beings to gather on a Friday evening to explore what is the effect if we work together, use the community energy, and in this meditative training, we're on purpose keeping love in mind. Because in a way, the real danger, the real, I guess, problem or enemy in human life is that our attention gets hijacked in ways that it isn't helpful. So we end up worrying about things we really don't need to worry about or fantasizing about things that just feed greed in the heart or something like that. And, uh, but when we study our own heart, we realize that the heart, the mind, it has this capacity to keep in mind, to keep our attention on what's truly wholesome. And so for tonight, we can use the theme of loving kindness and just you know, <laughs> to study in our own heart, just how can I keep that tender hearted, forgiving quality of mind in mind? How can I practice not forgetting, not taking the many off ramps into worrying, into judgment, into rage? And it's not in any way a kind of judgment that that other activity of mind is bad. <clears throat> it's just more that there's a group of human beings that are interested in the very real cause and effect. What happens to my mind, my heart, when I keep compassion in mind? And in a way we're feeding the attitude, the quality of love, by keeping it in mind. This is a little pointing out we get from the Buddha's teachings that these wholesome qualities of mind like compassion, tenderheartedness, forgiving, these wholesome qualities grow, deepen, broaden when they're seen as they are. In the same way, if we have that clear Balanced awareness of unwholesome qualities tends to weaken the unwholesome, just as it tends to strengthen the wholesome. And this is something we want to check out for ourselves. Is this actually true? And it isn't, it's really important, you know, all of us, because we've been fed a bunch of bowl, basically, about love through our lives and our, you know, different teachings we received. And uh, it's really important that we undertake a really pragmatic, independent approach to understanding what to do with this human life and more specifically what to do with this human heart and how we can grow and develop, strengthen the kind of qualities of heart that are actually healing and dependable and useful for the wider world and how we can weaken and uproot the kind of heart qualities, mental qualities that aren't good for me and aren't good for anyone. And this is really the, the training we find in the Buddhist teachings. And of course, it's not exclusive to the Buddhist teachings. He was just someone with a really powerful capacity to articulate his own independent work where he took his own heart and mind and used it to study the heart and mind. So before we settle in, it's just nice in these sort of settings for us just to take a moment and acknowledge the ground we're sitting on
you know, even though we're not in the same space, we're sitting on this planet here in Minnesota, you know, in so many ways, we're sitting on land, indigenous land, in my case, the Dakota people and further no north, the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe people who took care of this land for a long, long time. And this country sitting on the land of this country built to a large degree on the backs of enslaved people for many centuries. And of course, there are many, 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 many layers of oppression and suffering didn't begin here on this continent, of course. So many reverberations. And the, the point of doing this reflection of kind of grounding our spiritual work in the reality that we're inhabiting is just to because so much of what we have to work with when we are fortunate enough to have a little time to sit down in a comfortable posture, turn inward. Of course, we're going to feel all of the reverberations of the cultural trauma, the historical trauma, the reverberations of the particular time and place, the pandemic, the disturbances in our social and political lives, the disturbances in our family lives. And of course, we'll feel the benefit of any harmony that we have with our friends and family and wider communities. So we say, you know, we kind of open up to the present moment, we feel the body, but the body, it's like the skin of a drum. It's just, it's just reverberating everything that's moving in and around us through history, arriving in this moment, feeling like what it feels like for each of us with our specific cultural, ethnic, racial, gender locations, identities. We're just these very sensitive creatures. And it's yeah, one of the things, the first things we discover taking on the Buddhist teachings and the practices is it is not easy being a sensitive human being. That's why we need community. That's why we need to tap into joy. And interestingly, in terms of what we're going to do tonight, compassion, which is basically using the truth of suffering as a meditation object, but relating to the truth of suffering in our own lives and the lives of others around us, using it as a meditation object, relating to the suffering with that tender heartedness, that feels good. It's a kind of paradox, I know. Acknowledging the truth of suffering actually is stabilizing enlivening and ultimately liberating. In the same way that <clears throat> undertaking strategies of denial and um, blaming, it's deadening and it's stressful. And as we sometimes say, it eats our heart out, running away from the truth of our shared existence. So with that in mind, we'll do uh, sit for about 35 minutes and we'll do a little stretch. And then we usually take the last half an hour or so and uh, we decide to be responsible together for the learning we've had. Like, how do we see love moving in our lives? What have we learned? What's in the way? So I'll kind of introduce that open discussion time after the stretch. And first, let's take our time to settle in, listen to your body, do what you need to do to soothe and settle the whole system as best you can. And of course, we all know that it won't be perfect, but we do the best we can.
And that might include some longer, deeper breaths in and out. And just as if a dear, dear friend, benefactor, loved one were to place their hands on our shoulders or touch our back or whatever might feel supportive, we can have the same sense with this easy, deep breath in and out, a real self-soothing self-settling. Breathing in in a way that feels good in the body and then breathing out in a way that feels good in the body. And just keep adapting and adjusting. Listen and respond so you're really taking care both the body and then energetically on this energetic and emotional level as well. I care enough about this life, this body, this heart to breathe in in a thoughtful, tender-hearted way and to breathe out in a thoughtful, tender-hearted way. And eventually Allow the breathing to continue on its own. And as you sense the breathing body here, perhaps just feeling some gratitude that the body knows how to breathe. We don't need to oversee it. And however the breathing process is, we just trust the body to do the breathing. And keep sensing the sitting body, the breath and the depth of all that can be felt here in the sitting body, energetically, emotionally, physically, the full range of the experience here. And it might become abundantly clear that it isn't easy being a human being and you could just repeat this to yourself silently a few times, something like, it really isn't easy being a sensitive human being. It isn't easy feeling what's here to feel right now giving permission for whatever needs to move, to move now. It isn't easy. Staying open and exposed to the heart and body. But I care enough for this life do my best to stay awake, to 
do my best to stay open and to simply feel what's here to feel now. In a sense, giving permission for everything to move without imagining that I know it or I know how it should move. No expectations, no agenda except to be open and to feel and to allow. So even without using the word forgiveness, in a very real and direct way, we're forgiving the body, we're forgiving the heart, the mind, and really we're forgiving the world for being the way that it is right now, feeling the way that it feels. And it comes from this deep truth that I don't want to be the one who resists. I don't want to be the one in denial anymore. It's too heavy. So instead I forgive myself. I forgive this body, this heart and world for being the way that it is. It's almost as if the good heart is realizing that forgiveness is an act of self-love. I no longer want to be the one who's afraid or tight, rageful. So as best I can, I forgive this body and all of its tightness. As best I can, I forgive this heart, any numbness, any rage, any pain whatsoever. I forgive this mind and I forgive this world, my friends, my enemies, understanding how all of us are swept away by so many causes and conditions. The tug the push of our cultural conditioning, our animal conditioning, all these conditioning forces that make things the way that they are. Doesn't mean that things are okay the way that they are. It just means that in this moment, I choose to practice forgiveness putting down the load of resentment, of hatred, putting down the load of disconnection as best I can. I forgive myself. I forgive others and I forgive the world. As best I can, I offer forgiveness all around. So feel free to use your own words. We'll have several minutes now of silence. And just find your own creative ways to keep this reflection on forgiveness going. It can be really simple, it can be wordless even.
but be willing to be a little creative as you tune into the wholesomeness of forgiveness. As best I can, I forgive this imperfect world. I forgive as best I can my imperfect enemies, my imperfect dear ones and friends, family. And I forgive my imperfect self, this body, this tender heart here, as best I can, I forgive myself. And we keep practicing forgiveness in creative ways until we sense this generous quality of compassion this capacity right here in our own heart to embrace our lives, to embrace our world with compassion. I care about suffering. I'm learning not to be afraid to be close to my own suffering, the suffering of all my dear ones, and the suffering of the world. May the deepest wisdom and love protect us all. So whenever you feel that strength of heart, that generous, expansive, fearless strength of heart that Seems like it has a really honest relationship with the truth of suffering, your own, <clears throat> the suffering around you that you're aware of. Then practice abiding in a way you learn to rest, trust it, and really feel the expansive quality of that love of compassion can even sense it filling the space of the body, the heart and mind. Kind of fearless, radiant, generous love that isn't 
confused by the truth of suffering, doesn't expect the world to be different than it is. And you might need initially a phrase or phrases to help keep compassion in mind. Something like, I'm not afraid of the truth of suffering. May the deepest wisdom and love protect us all. But of course, just come up with your own word or words. And we use these supportive phrases to help keep the truth, the actual experience of compassion in mind. So we can really sense how it grows and expands. And we learn how to rest in the great space of the compassionate heart and allow it to have its healing effect. So again, we'll take some silent time for you to practice creatively on your own.
we can always begin again. Something simple, recognizing I care about suffering, the suffering right here in this heart. I care about the suffering in all my dear ones, my dear friends and family. I care about the suffering in the world. I care enough to stay close, undefended, open, to feel what it feels like to be right here in the middle. Honest about the truth of suffering. I care enough to allow this beautiful wish to arise in my heart. May the deepest wisdom and love protect us all. Guide us as we learn how to take care of each other better. May the deepest wisdom and love protect us all. And see if you can notice the stability and the radiance of compassion. It's really possible to abide in that expanded, stable attitude of love. And if your own suffering is what seems really real and apparent, then let the practice have more of the flavor of self-compassion. And at other times, the compassion will feel able to hold the whole world. nothing left out, even our enemies and their suffering will touch the heart.
And compassion turns out to be a beautiful, enlivening way of being. We're not getting sucked into the truth of suffering. We're feeling quite stable with the heart's care, the heart's really beautiful wish, may this suffering be alleviated. My own suffering, the suffering of others, may the deepest wisdom and love protect us all, guide us all. And it might even, you might even discover how good it feels for the heart to break open in this tender hearted way, not being afraid of being sensitive, not being afraid of caring. May the deepest love and wisdom protect us all. I realize I was on mute. Forget how long it's been. <laughs> but I was talking for a while, just so you know. <laughs> but probably the way you were practicing was better than what I was saying. So I hope for that. Great. Well, the last thing I mentioned was just you know, as we were coming out of the sit, just to sense the people in the, in the Zoom room. So we can do that now. And just realize as we're looking here on the Zoom screen and then in the rooms around us and the other apartments or homes around us so that we're learning to bring this tenderizing thing we did during the formal meditation we're actually, we want to learn to live in that tender hearted way. Sometimes I jokingly call it, we want to be uh, willing to be broken hearted, the walking wounded, that that's actually um, a powerful, empowered way of living to have this sort of broken hearted, tender hearted, as opposed to feeling like the only way to survive is to be armored. And clearly, there are reasons why we shut down. 
and sometimes that's the only strategy we have to survive. It's just too much, too intense. But when we're fortunate, when we're privileged enough to have enough safety, like maybe tonight for some of you or all of you, then we practice putting down the armor and we really sense that natural capacity of the heart to include more and more, more and more of our own suffering, more and more of the suffering of the world and to relate to it in that generous way. I may not have answers, but I care. I care enough to feel what it feels like to be open. I care enough to wish well for myself and wish well for others. I care enough to include include everything. And that we realize is a powerful way to live a human life. Just like it's not a workable strategy to close down. It's totally understandable that we close down. So I don't want to judge myself or judge others when that's the best we can do is shut down, close down, distract ourselves or whatever it might be. But when we, when we have sort of support, then that's the time to find another way. And really the definition of love and compassion, it's that understanding, that way of relating that isn't confused like with compassion, it isn't confused by suffering, isn't thrown off balance by suffering. Doesn't mean that we don't feel touched by suffering. It just means the mind, the heart, isn't confused by that exposure, by the intensity of what it feels like. Some of you I'm assuming are parents, I'm not. <clears throat> but um, I can imagine it's really hard to watch your child suffer, you know, like when they're being teased at school or something like that. And you know how much that hurts. And sometimes there's something you can say and do, but sometimes there's nothing really you can say and do except to be loving, to be like we're sort of there with our child or with a friend who's really hurting. And what we're doing is we're practicing not being afraid of their suffering because they've got to learn how to not be afraid of their suffering. So as a friend or as a parent, we're right there to whatever degree we sense their exposure, their suffering, then we practice like being aware. And what gives us that stability is that powerful wish, may wisdom and love protect us always. So it's some sense of just because it hurts intensely, just be because the mind doesn't know what to do, just because there's a lot of anger or a lot of loneliness or a lot of whatever we're feeling or the other person's feeling, doesn't mean I have to shut down. I have to close down. And this is what we're, what love sort of helps us uncover. It's kind of the active side of wisdom. You know, a lot of people, even in a, sometimes in a judgmental way, they kind of boo-hoo the Buddhist teachings because it sounds like the sum total of what the Buddha is saying is like, yeah, there's suffering, but you can be really cool with suffering, you know, as if, as in the sense of being distant, but, but really the, the expression of wisdom, the whole point of wisdom is that we can take it on the road into breakup, into really exciting times and to really devastating times. And that, that capacity to be even and intimate and sensitive, then what allows us to navigate all the different terrain of life it's that if it's the different attitudes of love, appreciative joy when things are beautiful, 
tender-hearted compassion when things are painful, equanimity, that sort of radiant equanimity when things are confusing and ambiguous, friendliness pervading all the time. So we're going to have some open discussion time now. And as I mentioned early on, you know, we just as being human beings, sensitive human beings, by default, we basically are learning this simple lesson, closing down doesn't really work as a long-term strategy. Opening up with these different qualities of love actually is functional in a very straightforward, practical way. And we can share our learnings, both like how residing in a closed state, an aversive state, for example, like sharing how that arose and how it didn't help <laughs> in the long run, at least. Doesn't mean that anger is bad. And remember, there's, there are very loud versions of love, intense, loud, expressive versions of love. So let's, let's not, I say a lot of people think when, when from a Buddhist context, we say that anger isn't the way. They say, well, you know, Sometimes you need anger to get stuff done. And I would just call that, I wouldn't use the word anger because when I use the word anger, I mean an attitude of mind that is planting seeds of suffering. So I would call that fierce compassion or loud compassion, compassionate action when we have to speak things that might rock the boat or might cause someone to hurt a little bit, but in the long run, it's really in the direction of healing needed to be said but I wouldn't call that hate or anger. I would call that somebody saying what needed to be said. And sometimes we have to say that in really loud voice. But anyway, it's really good to hear from each other. And of course, it's always okay to ask questions about the practice or just about the Buddhist teachings generally, if you have them. Otherwise, just sharing where you're learning, like how to access the power and clarity of love how it's allowed you to show up in situations in your life pragmatically, practically, that really help. And what you've noticed gets in the way of trusting our natural capacity to reside or abide in these loving states of compassion, friendliness, appreciative joy, and equanimity. These are the four qualities the Buddha talks about. Yeah, anybody like to begin? And you can, we have a relatively small group. You can just unmute yourself and it's nice to introduce yourself with your name. And just so we don't misgender each other, you could even say your pronouns. That's always a good thing to do. Anybody like to begin? What have you been learning? Yeah, and other people might have some thoughts, but I'll, I'll just kind of respond briefly. Um, because, you know, someone like you, Jessica, who's been at it for a while, at the practice for a while, you know, you, you know in your bones that that becoming energy isn't helpful. So we, we tend to want to jump right to the resolution, like stop, stop identifying with becoming somebody who's beyond or different than I am or whatever. But the, the real practice is simply connecting with the truth of the moment. So when we notice that becoming energy, wanting to become better, wanting to become a good person, wanting not to be an angry person or a judging person or whatever it might be, the practice is that tender-hearted willingness to feel what it feels like to be, to be caught in that becoming energy. Instead of going right to, I shouldn't fall into that trap. I know better than to fall into that trap. Prove, you know, like realize that superpower. I'm someone who's willing to feel what it feels like to be an imperfect, ignorant human being one more time caught up in becoming energy. Right. You know, thinking that if only I become Mark's perfect, you know, picture of who I think I should be, then, because uh, that's how things resolve themselves is by connecting with the truth of the way it is. So the simple phrase that I might use is something like, so what's the feeling here? 
So I notice the becoming energy and then immediately, because otherwise I'm going to go exactly like you said to or stop it. We might have been in the same class last night. I got activated too in my own way. And uh, it's such a yucky feeling when our stuff gets activated. And uh, I mean, it was late into the night and I was still, I probably reminded myself in different ways a couple dozen times in that three hours after this program, Jessica, I'm one of the teachers in this program and we're looking at the intersection of our Dharma practice and the trauma that all of us have regardless of our racial background of, of just racial trauma. So we're using Resma Medicam's book. I don't know if this is what you were referring to, Jessica, but, but anyway, just some stuff, you know, cause this is difficult work to kind of acknowledge our conditioning and uh, yeah, and how many different ways to uh, we notice our defensiveness and then we feel like we've got to resolve that. But the real work is like, so what's the feeling here? And to really use the embodied sense, what's the feeling here? Is it safe for me to feel what I'm feeling? And this is not just around, it's really around any work. So it's just like, because the whole Dharma path is just learning to see what we're not seeing yet, whether it's around, you know, any kind of conditioning, whether it's racial conditioning around gender, around power, around being a human being, around becoming energy or whatever. Any other thoughts, Jessica? Yeah, thanks so much for getting us started. Who would like to speak next? And just to kind of give ourselves permission that, because we, we sort of feel, we, we wrongly assume that the way I perceive the world is the only way that it can be perceived. Like in terms of your perception of that note, Sally, and the initial way you read the note, the mind sounds like the mind kind of highlighted the uh, angry part of the words that this person used, right? And then, uh, then it impacts our heart, our sensitive heart in a very particular way when we're noticing the angry part of the note. But when we realize like this is one of the things that our Buddhist awareness practice reveals is that perception is always a constructed activity. Meaning there's like even this moment right now, we can be constructing this like if you're in a particularly judgmental place, like judging me, for example, then you're tuning in. Oh, I don't like the way Mark's voice sounds, or I don't like this, or I don't like that. And, and we're, you, we're kind of collecting evidence to um, fit our way of perceiving this moment. So it's in a way it becomes self-fulfilling. And then with a lot of spiritual practice, we realize it's always a constructed thing. So what kind of world do I want to reconstruct right now? <laughs> like it's in play. We don't have to construct it just in the way we've constructed it in the past. We can notice the habit to construct it in terms of, um, you know, reasons to be angry at the person, but there are other ways to construct it. And that's kind of what I heard you saying, Sally, how to be skillful in all these ambiguous situations. Should you give all your money away? No money away? There's no answer. And uh, the key is this feeling we have in the heart about that ambiguity, about being aware of other people's suffering. We feel like in a superficial way, we wanna get rid of the, the impact, the yucky feeling. But I think with more and more living, more and more wisdom, we realize we either choose to be numb or we choose to be sensitive. If we choose to be sensitive, we're always gonna be feeling a lot. Can that be okay? Like, and, and part of that is like learning to forgive yourself. Well, of course you don't know what to do with that person at the gas station. How, how could you know? And it's like both be, like deconstructing it, like, yeah, partly 
I was afraid. And partly the heart rose to the occasion, right? I mean, it's like, it wasn't just one thing or the other. It was mixed. Well, of course, that makes sense it was mixed. We're imperfect human beings in an imperfect world. Why would we imagine we handled it perfectly? You know, and the, this is the great thing. It's like that incident was what it was and what the reverberation in your heart, that's just what it was. But your life, there's always the next chapter. Like even you talking about it here with us is one more time for you to feel and relate a little bit more skillfully to whatever's left reverberating from that interaction you had last night. Like maybe now a little bit more forgiveness, a little bit more space, maybe even some resolves to actually have more of a human contact with that person, even if it's just in two seconds, you know, like actually, because a lot of times, you know, I noticed when I'm giving money or support, it's like, I just want to get out of there. And the, the giving some money or whatever I might do, it's just like a way to get away from that feeling. And I realize how hard it is for me to actually emphasize being relaxed and having a momentary human contact with another human being. That for me is really hard. And it doesn't depend on whether I give money or don't give money, or sometimes I have little, those cliff bars, you know, that I'll give, I just keep them in my glove compartment. So I always have something to give. And, uh, but it's, what I notice is really hard for me is actually meeting the human being and letting my heart be touched. That's scary to me. And I'm a little bit more honest than I used to be about that, you know, that exposure, that vulnerability. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine, for sharing with us. Thank you, Mark. Really beautiful to hear, Nancy. Yeah, and this is, you know, related to just, there's always the next chapter. So, because we're gonna, you know, this is the, the more practical side of the Buddhist teachings on anatta, the impersonal nature, is when we act out in our relationships and cause harm, um, you know, there's, then the next moment is, well, how am I going to relate to the fact that I just acted out and caused harm? And it's like, that's the next chapter. So it doesn't matter if we dug a hole, then the next moment is how to relate skillfully to the fact that I've dug a hole for myself. What would that look, what could that look like? Because that's like a really beautiful thing, like you described. would like to go next. But what you're talking about, Christina, is really goes to the heart of how the Buddha talked about things. And it's really the bridge or the connection between wisdom and love. And in Buddhism, we call that karma. And, you know, a lot of times people don't understand like how the Buddha used the teachings on karma. He's basically saying cause and effect, conditionality. And that's what you were just talking about and uh, things unfold lawfully, just like you described this relationship between your daughter and her friend. And when things are this way, then the per you know then this gets set in motion, and then things end up this way. And you know when we're in the middle of cause and effect and things happening, we get triggered, we get activated, we hurt, and we we lose our capacity to to, to kind of connect the dots of cause and effect. Right. But maybe later, maybe even months later, you and your daughter, when it's not charged, right, can reflect back about cause and effect. Oh, that's how that unfolded. That's why it happened the way that it did. Because that's what really helps us show up in the world is this capacity. I mean, it's really because we care, because we're compassionate because we don't want to plant more seeds for more suffering, we want to read cause and effect. How should I be relating? How can I relate? How can I show up in this situation? 
what is the skillful way to be relating to this person? Speaking truth to power or keeping my mouth shut for a while? You know, it's like, and, it, and th this is the hard thing is to, to realize that we don't, there's no escaping karma. There's no escaping that how we're relating matters. So we might as well be reading it real time, not expecting to get it perfect, but knowing that it matters. Okay, I wanna, I don't wanna plant any more seeds of suffering than I have to. So let me be as awake and kind as I can, as I do my best to read my life and what's moving moment by moment. Yeah, thanks, Christina, for sharing that. Would like to go next. We have time for at least one more person. Anybody have an example from your life that feels useful to share with the group? Question that might be emerging. Why don't we just end by doing the four quarters chant and just do the verse on compassion. So you'll see, I, I pasted it there <clears throat> further up in the chat. And a lot of you know this, but we'll just do the verse on compassion. So, but the four qualities of love, loving kindness, compassion, gladness, and equanimity are listed. And if you're not familiar with how we sing this or chant this, you'll catch on and I'll lead, but everybody else will have uh, your sound muted. So let's make compassion shine forth. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth, so above and below around and everywhere and to all as to myself i will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with compassion abundant exalted immeasurable without hostility and without ill will. Thanks so much for the wise sharings tonight, everyone, and just being here. Really great to be together. There's a half day retreat tomorrow afternoon. If you'd like to join in one to five central time, Shelly Graf and I will be doing leading a two day retreat uh, a week from today, all day Friday and all day Saturday next weekend. Uh, join in if you'd like for that and many other things coming up. You can just check uh, Comic Grounds calendar.